check, check. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome and happy Monday. Woohoo! <laughs> Did you have a good start in the week? Yes, yes. a lot of excitement. That's, uh, that's great. Because today the weather is also playing along. We had a great day so far. And now, uh, yeah, we enter the metaverse or we will explore it. Um, before we do that, um, uh, we do this together here, Thomas and me. We wanted to introduce ourselves uh, to you, of course. Um, and yeah, Thomas, maybe uh, do a brief intro who you are and uh, also what Techonomy is doing because we host this event together today. Yes, thank you, Philip. Uh, thanks, guys, all for coming. Uh, as, uh, as Philip already mentioned, today we are gathered to uh, go in get uh, deeper, uh, to go into a deep dive for, uh, for everything around the metaverse, spatial computing, etc. Um, so for me personally, I'm a digital innovation director at Economy, and at Economy, um, we also uh, believe in the power of sharing knowledge and innovation. So what we're doing with the clients all over the world is um, actually combining all the uh, assets within digital marketing to create value to meet your business goals, to create impact. And that's why we want to collaborate together with, uh, with Philip and the High Tech Compass to bring the community together and to show you and provide you with clear, actionable steps on how to see the metaverse, what you can do with it, and how you can start with it today. That's why we also uh, called the event. We, we were not talking about Web3 or metaverse. We wanted to make it much more tangible and uh, much more sustainable. So uh, thanks all for, uh, for coming. and. Uh, Nice, yeah. Thanks for the intro words. Uh, yeah, I will, I will keep it short. I'm Philip from the High Tech Campus. I'm a business developer, emerging tech. Uh, so what we do as High Tech Campus, we also look uh, five to ten years ahead what technologies will be relevant then. Uh, we started an AI innovation center already in 2019 because we saw the trend of AI already coming up. Um, and we saw the same uh, or see the same basically in the tech stack around we could say immersive technologies. Uh, so we will also basically open a hub for that topic of the metaverse and immersive technologies, and that's, this hub will be called Threality. So that's why you see that name also here uh, on the board. Yeah, the program. Uh, we will do uh, the, the opening together. We will. Uh, we have a few slides for you to share some insights, uh, and then of course we will have Aragon and Patrick uh, basically going into uh, the depths with their interactive keynote. Um, of the topic of the metaverse and what it is like uh, or how it is boosted also in the era of AI and spatial computing. Uh, they will also host then the panel discussion that is following and Thomas and me will wrap up the event afterwards and then we can have some drinks and networking together. Yes, um, I think first of all before we start we go deeper into the subject together uh, like, like Philip said with, with Aragon and Patrick. Uh, for us, it's really important that you guys have, uh, have also clear, actionable steps, like I said. Like, what can I do with it tomorrow? How can I start with it today? Um, also showing you some examples of it, how you should see it, um, why it's so relevant right now, and how you can act on it. And um, yeah, to, to, uh, to in implement it also in your marketing strategies uh, tomorrow already. Um, guiding you through the digital transition. That's also what we're doing with our clients on a daily basis, and I think that's why uh, we think it's so relevant to, to give you and provide you with all this knowledge um, so you have a clear view. Because there's a lot of said about the metaverse, about all the technologies within Web3, but in the end, how can you use it right now? And in the end, offer some key learnings and inspiration. Uh, I think that's the most important one. You see, obviously, a lot of big brands building big worlds, uh, within spatial, uh, within sandbox, etc. But how you can, can you start like really low end if you don't have the budgets or the manpower to do to uh, to uh, implement something like that? All right. Let's start. So the metaverse. Uh, we had an event last year in uh, May. It was about the metaverse. Is it fiction or reality? Um, and then uh, Nvidia concluded uh, the metaverse as a big world doesn't exist yet. Um, and that's also what I pointed out here, a massively scaled and interoperable network, uh, uh, network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds. It's a really big explanation and it's a really big, let's say, uh, uh, world that is all 3D. We could go in with the, with the VR glasses and meet each, each other. Um, and I think already here, 
the problem of the topic metaverse started because this seems like it's all about a 3D world. Um, and if I look at today's use cases, I see a lot of use cases coming up. They are more fragmented, but they are coming up. Um, but they are more scattered and they are not only a 3D world. Um, and I think it can be really nicely illustrated when you look at the industry. Uh, because in the industry, you can really see that the term industrial metaverse is really staying and they were really using it. Um, and I think it's because they managed to connect it back to the real world. And, and this is the essence of the topic of a, of a metaverse, uh, from my point of view, to work. Uh, so we brought this uh, picture here. You see on the one hand the digital world. So this could be a digital twin of a factory uh, so that you basically can optimize uh, uh, the factory before it's even built. Um, or you have a faster process of, of R&D before you even go to the market. But this always has to be linked in the end to the real world, to the physical world. Um, and only by building this bridge I think the topic of the metaverse in the end can work uh, and will work. Uh, and potentially you can see the same at the moment when you think about uh, the glasses. Uh, most of these glasses are now also more towards augmenting, augmenting reality and not about a full virtual reality. Uh, and we said, okay, we want to build a hub for that tech stack, uh, so let's do so. And when we did it, yeah, probably our communication was also not 100% on point. Uh, because the folks can't picked it up and they said the high-tech campus is building a VR hub Yeah So you see this topic still needs a lot of exploration uh, It's probably horror for every marketing team that wants to have a very precise messaging uh, Because there's not only one term, but there are several terms uh, and to highlight also this dimension of several terms uh, we created this word cloud to show you one time what is all out there to describe a bit the same things, but also not. So you have the spatial internet, augmented reality, uh, you have Web3. Then uh, the, I think the Europe European uh, Union came up with the term Web4. So there's a lot of, lot of different terms. Um, and when we saw this, we th thought again, okay, we are on the right track when we are basically want to open here an innovation hub for that topic. Because we see that this world is still very fragmented and we want to help to bring clarity basically in that topic uh, in the future uh, because there's a lot of value in the different use cases. So uh, yeah, we are uh, uh, developing it. Uh, you can see here where I stand uh, two or three weeks ago uh, in the building. It's opposite here uh, that we are currently renovating and building up. Uh, and I wanted to share also some basically renders of what the hub will look like. Uh, so the Reality Hub, uh, you can see here is already some co-working spaces will be there. Uh, also a bigger event space, uh, because at this hub, what is the purpose of it? Well, we want to host companies that are basically offering solutions in that domain. We already have four residents who will come to the hub, companies in digital twinning, companies with an indoor spatial platform. Um, but we also will partner with companies to educate further around that topic and uh, to build it further up. So, yeah, having said this, also you can see here the terms uh, we chose to use at the moment is the spatial internet and immersive technologies because it's always about blending the two worlds, blending the physical world and blending the digital world. Yeah, then I will give the word now to Thomas to uh, guide us to some use cases and then we are waiting for, cannot wait for Aragon. Thanks. Yes, thanks, Philip. Before we dive deeper into the subject, and Aragon, Patrick, uh, have a whole hour to, to, to guide you through that landscape, but before, I just wanted to zoom out, because how can the metaverse help your business today? And I just uh, highlighted like six categories where I think that could be relevant for you. If it's B2B, if it's B2C, in the end, it's all about reaching new audiences. We see today with uh, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, uh, consuming brands, uh, interacting in a different way with brands, organizations. It's, it's uh, one channel, and you could see the, the metaverse as a channel right now, where you can uh, get in touch with, with that audience. Uh, obviously, changing behavior is another one, because um, they're also interacting in a different way. They're expressing themselves in a different way. Loyalty and engagement. I think that's the main struggle for a lot of brands and organizations. Like, how can you create uh, loyal and recurring customers? How can you interact with them? Uh, and I think that's a main challenge for them. And Metaverse can be, uh, be a solution for that. 
Uh, you see a lot of worlds within Roblox, Wimble Wimbledon does it, Nike does it. They have all like uh, interactive gamified elements in it so that you can also consume, for example, uh, a sports game, but also in the meantime, interact with your friends. When you look at B2B, working spaces, uh, Triality obviously opened the hub, but why you can't just make it scalable to make a metaverse hub where people from Asia, for example, can interact also with the people working here uh, in the hub. Enhanced training and education, you can create for B2B organizations training programs that are scalable for workers uh, all around the world. And obviously product demonstrations uh, and prototyping, products that aren't exist uh, at this moment, big machineries, complex products wh where you can just explain it in a brief way that it makes it, makes it much more easy in a sales and marketing uh, stage. But why now? I guess, uh, Philip, you already mentioned it, but uh, obviously with, um, with the upcoming and also the release of the Apple Vision Pro, a lot has changed already and will change in the upcoming year. Um, even if it's a, a, um, a quite expensive product, you see like how everybody's reacting, how everybody is talking about it. And you see now a lot of developers are already creating uh, new apps that, that are integrating with, uh, with this uh, new hardware. Besides that, you see user expectations. Uh, like I said, Gen Z and Gen Alpha are consuming uh, everything differently than we do right now. For us, it's, uh, for example, quite obvious that we're using LinkedIn as a platform to express, to talk about our business, that we interact with, with others, with like-minded. But maybe Roblox in the future or uh, Fortnite, for example, will be a platform where they interact and where they, uh, where they uh, gather their information. And that's uh, and at last, I, I don't know if you guys saw this one, but this is the CEO of Porsche with the release of their newest car. Uh, he couldn't attend the event to release, uh, but he used the Apple Vision Pro to be part of it. And that's what uh, this hardware brings you also, a new opportunity to have an immersive experience like you're sitting in the car and you're attending the event. But what is already happening today, what we're seeing, obviously, like Philip said, the metaverse isn't here, but maybe it is already in some kind of way because we are consuming uh, already sport matches in a different way with VR glasses on, uh, with AR lenses on it, where you feel like you're in the stadium or sitting courtside at an NBA game. It's also changing the behavior by integrating gamification elements into your marketing or in, uh, in your marketing or business strategies. And I just added a few examples, for example, Oracle, where they use gamification to build your cloud stack. Uh, and afterwards, you get an invitation for a B2B event. Um, or what we did uh, for ourselves, for, for Deloitte, where we created uh, a gamification campaign where uh, we were looking for, uh, for students that had quite a difficult profile for the recruitment. Uh, but by gamification, we created a whole new world where they can interact with gamification. And basically with that, we, we gathered more than uh, 2,000 new, new leads for them. And at last, maybe um, in combination with, with a digital twin, with re recreating B2B, B2C uh, level metaverse, uh, McLaren did it also with, with, uh, with Roblox by creating, uh, recreating their factory with, by presenting their new car, but where you could also play games and also interact with, with the drivers itself. I think from here on, we're going to give the word to, uh, to our keynote speakers of today, uh, Aragon and Patrick, um, founders of the Innovation Network, and they're going to dive deeper into uh, everything that we just touched in the upcoming hour, uh, and afterwards we go into uh, the panel discussion um, and some networks with rings. Yes, yes? thank you. <laughs> Luca, light. Let's go. Are you all awake? Are you ready? Yes. Cool. I forgot my clicker. I'm going to ask you guys to do something, and girls. Are there any girls in the room? Can I hear the girls? Yes. Do something that's going to be a little bit awkward, but you're going to do it anyway, because it's going to be awesome. Close your eyes and just listen to my voice. <laughs> it's early morning. You're still lying in bed. 
the perfect moment to wake up has arrived. You know this because your artificial intelligence health tracker has been tracking your heart rate at a thousand times per second for the last 15 years. And it knows that you are perfectly recovered. You had the exact amount of sleep. Hey there, sleepyhead. It's a beautiful day and you've got a whole day of adventure ahead of you. Let's get up and get going. Shall we go over your schedule for yeah, today? Yeah, 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 I'm getting up, I'm getting up. So you sit up, you throw your legs over the edge of the bed, you look around the room and you think to yourself, wow, life has changed so much in just 15 years. There's so much less in my room, less furniture, less pictures, less statues, less stuff. But as you stand up and you grab your augmented reality glasses and you walk to the bathroom, the room springs to life. And your artificial intelligence dragon pet flies towards you, telling you good morning, while you look at pictures from your life that are moving and three-dimensional. They're NFTs, such a weird word that was 10 years ago, but now they're the standard. And as you walk into the bathroom and you throw your toothpaste into your mouth, your artificial intelligence is trying to tell you that you forgot to put your pants on, but you can't hear it. You say, okay, it's gonna be all right. And you walk to your office, and as you enter your office, and you look out across the Swiss Alps, and you say, I am ready. Alert, alert, we have a meeting in 30 seconds. Yeah, 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 okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. I'm ready. And in front of you, the room springs to life, and suddenly there's 150 people, and you say, good evening, high-tech compass, Eindhoven. Good evening, reality. Let's talk about the future. And you can open your eyes now, and Luca can turn on the lights. So, how many of you, let's have a look, how many of you believe this is a real future? You're gonna experience this in your lifetime. Don't, don't be queasy. Sh show of hands, higher, I can't see your hands. That's quite a lot of people. I think that's a good thing for the high-tech campus I know. <laughs> How many people think this is absolutely bonkers, never gonna happen? One person there over in the left, okay. I'm gonna count on you to be the skeptic tonight, okay? I'm gonna tell you tonight, together with Patrick, that we're closer than you think. First question, how long is the history of humanity? How long have we been around in our current version update? Sorry? 70,000 years, almost. 200,000 years, Homo sapiens. Second question, how long is recorded history? Or how long has civilization been around? 20,000, somebody said. 6,000. 12,000 is the right answer. 10,000 before Christ and then 2,000 since we started counting. And that's interesting because if you look at this, this was generated with ChatGPT, by the way, Advanced Data Analyzer. You see that there's a whole lot of stuff going on there, but then only at the end there's this big blob. So about 6,000 years ago, we invented something incredible. Do you guys know what it is? We use it every day. When you do the garden, when you drive to work. Anybody? 6,000 years ago, we invented the wheel. Incredible moment. You should have seen the, uh, the, the social media posts. They went viral, it was crazy. 4,000 years ago, we started to do something else. We started to smelt iron. Incredible, the Iron Age. But only 250 years ago, something truly incredible happened, and this is where you see that big blob. Anybody can tell me what that is? A lot of murmuring. Energy? Internet, 200 years ago? No, no, no. <laughs> close though, close, close. This was the Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment was followed by the Industrial Revolution, the first one. So what is going on here? In the last 250 years, we had the Enlightenment and all Industrial Revolutions. 
That means that 99.999% of all technology that we use today, that we know today, everything we, we wear on our body today was invented in the last 250 years. <coughs> that means all of technology was created in the last 0.1% of all of human history. Let that sink in for a moment. The last 0.1% of all of human history. That's just over here. Chat GPT is over here. This is what our trajectory looks like. And by the way, if you didn't know, Cleopatra is closer to us in the pyramids of Giza. And she's closer to Chat GPT than she is to the pyramids of Giza. That's the effect of exponential growth, right? And it's very difficult for us to grasp that whole concept because we have all evolved in that flat line, which was all the time an exponential, exponential line, but we didn't really realize it. And there's a nice thought experiment of the Tower of Hanoi. Who knows this game? Maybe somebody who has kids? Yeah, exactly. So for do, the those who do not know, the objective of the game is to have a pile of disks on one pole. And then you have to transfer them from the left pole to the right pole. You can only take one disk at a time, and you're never allowed to put a larger disk on a smaller disk. Now, there's a legend about this tower. There's a, uh, a story about a small town called Varanasi in India. And there is an emperor called Fohi. And this is already a story from 600 years before Christ. And he made a golden tower with 64 of these disks, 64. And he had a community of pilgrims. And he presented as a puzzle. Can you solve that puzzle? How long do you think it took those pilgrims to solve the puzzle of 64 disks? Anybody? 100 years? Any more? You'll be surprised. This is a lot more than 100 years. They told us these were the smartest people on the high-tech campus. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing the math, I think, because uh, uh, this is, of course, an exponential, exponential curve behind this story. If they would take one second to place one disk, they would take 585 billion years to solve the puzzle. That's the power of the exponential uh, growth. <laughs> and for me, um, in, uh, so, um, and to see that curve, to understand how that grows, it's difficult for us, for, for the normal people. If you are a math mathematician or uh, uh, somebody like uh, von Neumann or Alan Turing or maybe Ray Kurzweil, they could foresee the effects of this exponential curve. So Ray Kurzweil wrote a book in 2004, which is a uh, recommendation for you, for those who do not know it. Uh, and he predicted that if you have this accelerating pace of change that Aragon just talked about, and you have the accelerating pace Moore's law, basically, where the computing power every two years doubles, then you get such a quick uh, rise of knowledge that he already predicted in 2004 that in 2023, the artificial intelligence would be on the level of one human person. And depending on how you slice and dice it, I think the last year was pretty obvious that ChatGPT was pretty powerful and all the large language models as well. He also is predicting that this will continue on an exponential scale. And he predicts that in 2045, there will be a singularity, an event horizon that can be so complex for us today to understand what will be happening there. And this has fascinated me my entire life. So I always wondered as a kid already, because you understand this, you learn this at school, exponential growth, but it's so difficult to envision how would the world look like today, right? And I've been growing up with, actually, this was one of the first computer games that I could play. And over the period of 45 years, it was all grown into now. This is a trailer of a game called Grand Theft Auto number no. six. It's going to be released. But if you're talking about the metaverse, you're talking about a 3D environment. This is a gaming where it becomes night and day, and there are NPCs and F there are characters that you can interact with. You can get a haircut. You can do everything in just a period of 50 years. And for a large part, thanks to 
British gentleman. In five years, we improved the computer graphics by 1,000 times in five years using artificial intelligence and accelerated computing. Moore's law is probably currently running at about two times. A thousand times in five years. A thousand times in five years is one million times in 10. We're doing the same thing in artificial intelligence. Jensen Huang, CEO of uh, NVIDIA. And before they are this huge AI company they are today, they s were uh, uh, working on machine learning and deep learning. And before that, they were getting big with the graphical user interface, with the graphical uh, calculation power. Uh, and that helped all those games become uh, better looking. So if I zoom in on specifically the development of artificial intelligence, we also see the same curve arise. The term artificial intelligence was coined somewhere in the 50s during a uh, conference. And it took a lot of years, all the way to 1997, before with brute force calculation, uh, we could basically beat uh, the best chess player at that point in time, Kasparov. And then it took another 20 years to do it in a different way. Because the moment that AlphaGo uh, defeated Lee Sedol in a game of Go, that was really deep learning. Because if you play the game of Go, who has played the game of Go? Oh, quite See, quite a few smart. People. Very nice. <laughs> the, mo the moment that I, the first time I heard it, I didn't really get it. I bought the game, I played it, and then you see how many options there are basically in the game. I've heard a story that there are more options than atoms in the world in if you play a game like, uh, like Go. And the computer was able, the artificial intelligence was able to find creative solutions, really creative, that have never been played in a game of Go in the existence of the game for 2,500 years. And then it, it went fast because at uh, November the 30th, we saw, of course, the rise of chat GPT coming from OpenAI. And that brings me to one year. And if I was wondering about how is my life looking in 2023, 2024, and today, this is exploded upon all our worlds, our complete world. So we have now text generation, we have image generation, we have, this will be the year of video generation, we can create any sounds, any code, any 3D environment, and all that was basically released upon the world in one year. And if there's one key thing that I would like you to take away from today is that it's very likely that in the next four years we'll see more technological advancement and improvements and developments than we've seen in the entire 20th century. Now, he doesn't believe that. <laughs> and um, you're not the only one that doesn't believe that. <laughs> in fact, there have been many people throughout history that don't believe things like this. In fact, 25 years ago, there was a well-known comedian who said this. Yeah, that's right, the information superhighway, the internet, the future. F*** you. <laughs> it's all hype. It's all, I've been on the internet. There's 12 people out there. It's all hype. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all hype. Don't believe a word we're telling you today. It's all hype. Complete nonsense. It's never going to happen. And still, many of you, and I've looked around, I've seen a few gray hairs, more than mine. Many of you were around for this stuff, the 80s, right? Look at that awesome boombox, right? But all of it, and, and the camera crew here is ro running around now, but look at this. This is everything you have in your pocket today with a mobile smartphone, right? But is it really a smartphone? That is the question you need to ask yourself. And the answer is no, it's not. It's not a smartphone because that implies we're using it to make calls mainly, but we don't. In fact, the thing we have in our pockets today is a brain-computer interface. And all of us are already cyborgs. The only step we need to make is to have it inside of our body. And we're working on that. <laughs> 2017 was an amazing year, and all of you here know why, right? We've already told you even, if you paid attention. So let's find out who did. What happened in 2017? Great. <laughs> this is how it always goes with great scientific breakthroughs. 
2017. Autobots, transform and roll out. <laughs> Before I go on, who loved this cartoon? Yes, Transformers is the best. 2017, they launched something called the Transformer model. A paper was released, and I always say the title wrong, but I think it is all you need is attention, or attention is all you need. Anyway, it's a paper that introduced the Transformer model for artificial intelligence. And why is this model so special? Well, if you break it down, and of course, simplification is never a good thing, especially not for academics, but if you break down the paper into three words, this is what it says. Everything is language. Everything can be interpreted as language. And once you know that, you can do incredible things. In Kenya's Samburu National Reserve, researchers are attempting to do something that's never been done before. We're looking at the tracking app right now and trying to figure out where everybody is. Using the power of artificial intelligence to speak to elephants in their own voice. Yep, we're speaking to elephants in their own voice. And that's going to be a really complicated conversation because elephants have really long memories. And it doesn't stop there. Because Aza Reskin, who's most well known for the docu-series The Social Dilemma, and then of course his The AI Dilemma talk, which he did from the Center of Humane Technologies, also has a little venture where they're doing some really cool stuff like this. Just like you can build a chatbot in Chinese without needing to speak Chinese, in the next couple of years, you know, one, three, five, we're gonna be able to build essentially synthetic whales, synthetic tool using crows that can fluently speak. It's just the plot twist is we won't yet fully know what we're saying. So just to make sure you truly understand this, this is a video of almost a year old, yes? And in this video, he's already talking about that they're building AI chatbots to talk to animals, yes? In fact, there is another video of him online and I highly recommend you look it up. I think it was on the Joe Rogan experience where he talks about talking to a whale by accident because they made a recording with the AI and then they used their sonar and they sent it out and they did that not really on purpose, but suddenly this big massive whale came up out of the water in Norway because what they sent out was, hey, I am Harry. And basically this whale came out of the water and said, no, I am Harry. Yeah, well, it was a little distraught. Um, they found out that there are pods of orcas going together with dolphins that each have their own language, but when they come together, they have a franca lingua where they speak to each other. And we're on the cusp of discovering what they're saying. But like he said at the end, we don't really know what we're saying, and there lies the crutch. Because as you know, for those of you that are Dutch, if you try to translate the word gezellig, it's not really possible because cozy doesn't quite catch it. And that's because of cultural differences. And now imagine having to talk to another species with a completely different frame of mind towards the world, towards social interactions. So there's challenges there. And yet, with AI, we're gonna overcome those. So, let me take you back to all these different ways that we can now generate anything that we want prompt-based because everything is language. And I'm going to walk you through some examples. And all the examples that we mention, we will also share in a leave behind after the session so you can look them up for yourself and play with them. But let's start with the one that we all know so much, uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT. Who here has a paid subscription on OpenAI? Paid subscriptions only. Everybody and else get out. A very good thing, a lot, a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, people paying for perplexity? Perplexity. Not a single one. Gemini? Claude, maybe? We're going to have a talk. It does represent. Uh, yeah. OpenAI has 60% of the market. And OpenAI is also one of the fastest growing platforms. It take, took them only two months' time to get from release in November to 100 million users in uh, January. And you see the same amount of growth also, if you look at how long it took for a global coverage on the internet, 20, 25 years, and then the mobile phone did it in 10, 15 years, 
And if you look at the tra trajectory that AI is on, it should be able to do that in five years. As again, you see that accelerating pace of exponential growth. And the type of use cases started, of course, with content creation. We all are creating content. Uh, and the second one became a lot of education. We can ask any question. We finally have this, this assistant that we would like to have. And assistance is the third case. Let's take a look at this one. Nope. Give me out, Luca, one back. Phil, just go back one, I think. Doesn't really do that. Do it anymore? Ah, oh, oh, just slow. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, one, yeah, yeah. two. <laughs> Super. No, so I, I doesn't want to go. I doesn't want to go. What I was about to show you there, what can verbally talk it. Um, you have this app that uh, probably you all seen it on Instagram that you can make a picture of a plant and then you can uh, get some uh, feedback on uh, the right nutrition for the plant. It's these type of companies that probably will disrupt it because that functionality, when uh, 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 ChatGPT is multimodal, it already works like that, right? We can also use that. So there was a video of that. And just recently, I think there was in November, right, that they opened uh, the GPT uh, store. It's now possible, and the people who have a paid subscription know this, uh, that you can create your own GPT, your custom GPT. So next to the intelligence that you're, is provided, you can set your boundaries and your data on a specific assistant that helps you to do cooking, writing, whatever it is. I recently had a company where they are filling in a lot of RFP documentations, and they had a full team doing that, two people, full-time job, filling in RFPs. And we played with this. We just uploaded some public documentation that they have, year reports, social reports, some things like that. And we tested it out right there on the spot. Within an hour, a lot of the questions that they had within the, the type of voice and the tone of voice that they would like to see were answered into that. It's these type of cases that are going to be disruptive and will lead to more assistance. Because the picture that Aragorn just showed about the guy with the the blaster and the CDs player and everything is like that, transformed into a telephone with 100 apps on it. But this process is going to help us get rid of those 100 apps and get to a couple of assistants that we like that arrange everything for us. Let's talk a little bit more about uh, image generation. Let me share a, uh, a personal story about using the usage of this. Um, leaving me behind. Luca, here you go, watch slide back. Thanks. In 2018, I uh, created a board game. And uh, that was, of course, fun to do. I love board games. And it was a lot of prototyping. It was a lot of designing. And uh, at a certain point, the game was finished. And I sold it to a label for a worldwide release. That label put away 80,000 euros for a designer to create all the cards that you see here. There are 150 cards. It was a year's job for one designer for that fee to create unique pictures. Corona came. Unfortunately, the, the label went bankrupt, and I got all the rights back from this game. And I was a little bit down by the whole process. The whole selling mechanism of this is kind of cumbersome. Um, so, but then Midjourney came along, and I was able, without, I have no skills at all in coding, no skills at all in graphic design, but with those tools, within three months' time, I was able to finish and complete the game, which has now been released. So, this was for me an epiphany moment that it only takes the creativity in your mind to create a website, 3D environments, and all these kind of things uh, with these tools. Yeah, so just... Just to add on Patrick here, because he didn't say so, everything you just saw, all the images you saw, everything, are cards from the game. And they look like professional art. And he just did that at home with AI. And that was my journey tree. 
Um, and uh, applications are picking that up and productizing this. What you see here is a standard feature from Alibaba for people who use the Alibaba platform. And whether you're using a real model or an AI generated model with clothes, you can put on any clothes on the model and even make it move to any way that you like. So that is basically all standard functionality uh, that is available on platforms such as Alibaba. And they included this uh, slide, if it comes. Exciting. Yeah. I don't dare to click it again because then we may be. Luca, can you go to the next slide? Yeah, we're talking about the technological yeah, singularity. Exactly. If a clicker doesn't work. If a clicker like this. <laughs> Can somebody help me from upstairs? Otherwise it gets a little bit... Mm -hmm. This looks like your uh, screen save, Aragorn. We go and have a look. Ah, here we go. This is a feature released by Midjourney last uh, last week. When I was creating those pirate pictures, it was pretty difficult to get character consistency. It's a uh, it's been a problem for everybody who's been playing with these tools. Last week they re released a, a uh, big feature, which is character consistency. You can now take any picture. Use that picture, highlight it as a, I want to use this person's face in any other configuration. So now you can make comics and all these kind of things uh, just like that. And that makes it also a nice leap towards video generation, right? So video generation last year was a bit behind. We had runway 10-second uh, videos. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, OpenAI dropped uh, Sora. And here are a couple of these videos that are generated by Sora from OpenAI. It can generate up to a one-minute videos, and you see the uh, prompts there as well. And this was just early 2024. What we expect to see in the coming uh, year, just maybe look at the, at the physics of it. Talking about physics. We only see the good videos, of course, because nobody has yet access to uh, Sora, just a selected couple of people. But this is also a Sora video. Do you How see it? There? Do you see it? How many do we How count? many dogs? <laughs> yeah, it's a matter of getting this, uh, this right. Cloning technology also took a massive leap this year. This is uh, the video equivalent of six fingers, basically, yeah. And of course, we couldn't uh, leave out Unreal, which is also a gaming company that is very much behind this transformation. On the left side, you see a burning car. And it is because that 3D moderator tool is on top that you see that it's actually an animation. But if I wouldn't say that and just have the clean video, everyone would just buy that is in, uh, that, that is in uh, a real burning car. And the same goes for- performance capture to work like a mirror. I need it to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. <sighs> and sometimes, all I need is a look. So to work like a mirror, I need it to capture whether I'm acting scared or angry. <sighs> and sometimes, all I need is a look. On the right side, you saw MetaHumans created with the Unreal Engine 5.2. And in the middle, you saw somebody recording that immediately on an iPhone, registering the facial expressions and immediately transferring it to a meta-human, which could be a great case if we kind of see the, the service agencies of the future in front of us. We will look like real humans. Let's go to another category. Let's go to sound generation. And uh, for every company that's out there, 
all the content that they have, whether it being a podcast or an e-training or educational material, everything from now on can be automatically translated. This is a podcast from Lex Friedman. Those who do not know it, also a big recommendation. Great speakers about AI on there. And Spotify is delivering to a selected amount of people auto-translate, which looks like this. How do you think? O sea, a modo de consejo, ya que lo estamos platicando, a diario, ¿qué opinas sobre los problemas difíciles del mundo? Is there anybody with a Samsung Galaxy phone in the room? One, two, three, four. New? This year? Old. Only new people. Show me your hands. <laughs> no? Okay. It's standard functionality, right? On the new yeah, Galaxy. Samsung. So in January this year, Samsung released something that a year ago I said would take two to three years. On the new Samsung phones, you have real-time translation. So you call to a Chinese person from Hong Kong and they speak Cantonese to you. The phone instantly translates it to Dutch or English. You can hear it and you can read it and you can answer in your own language. And this is also growing extremely fast. This is Suno, an application that lets you create a complete song, everything on it. On the top left, you'll see my original prompt, intense, dramatic cinema music about technology and humanity. The entire track, including all the lyrics, have been AI generated in five seconds. getting enough money from Spotify today. <laughs> Let's wait for next year. And uh, this functional functionality will also be productized. As a matter of fact, it is already productized. This is TikTok. For those of you who are on TikTok and plays video, you know you can select a song that comes with the video. AI song creation on the spot with the lyrics that you would like to have in your specific song for your post, including what kind of music, EDM, jazz, whatever, can be put on there. Behind all this is, of course, all the code that has been generated. Uh, I'm no coder, so I don't see it that often, but I have a lot of people who are coding and are using it to validate, to debug, to do with code. And the way to visualize this is, for instance, a company that we all know, Roblox, what Roblox is doing. You see, the user is just doing the prompts, the AI is making the prompts larger and is helping with the prompt, and the code is automatically generated on the back of it. I believe we have something new here as well. Yeah, but before we go into this, I'm just curious, how many of you have children? That's a lot of people. And what do these children do? The play GTA. Oh, no <laughs> Roblox? All day long, all day long. <laughs> how many of these kids play Roblox? That's quite a bit, yeah. yeah. And how many of you think that your kids should learn to code? Okay, well, keep that in mind. So this, this here is Mr. Scott Wu. And I put this in today to upset Patrick because we didn't prepare this slide. But the reason I put it in is because Scott Wu just launched with his company, Cognition, a completely new software package called Devin. And Devin is an artificial intelligence software engineer. And it does everything. And I mean everything. You basically give it a prompt and then it does Everything, the whole project. A year ago, when I said that this was going to happen, people said, no, you're crazy. You can't replace humans. But it's already happening today. If you leave today, go check it out, Devin. It's going to change your, it's going to blow your mind. You can do anything that needs a software engineer. You can do it on your own. Just get Devin. Sorry for the developers in the room. Any developers in the room, by the way? <laughs> okay, don't, don't turn your back to these guys. <laughs> Yes. So, and a lot of applications are also popping up that could create these entire 3D spaces that you need in the manifest to do that. 
And a great example, for instance, is Blockade Labs. Blockade Labs has this 360 pilot. So what you can do with a brush, you can design the street or environment that you would like to have. And just with a flip of the script, say, OK, I want it more cyberpunk. I want it more medieval. I want it more fairy tale. I want it more in the snow, et cetera, et cetera. Just think about how AI can now help to generate any kind of environment or any kind of gaming environment that we have and how that changes the workload of a developer for that as well. Here you have another brief video of a LiDAR produced 3D asset from a person's room that is also filled with blockade wraps. So you could take any space, for instance a space like this, and dress it up with this content like blockade Labs is doing. Yeah. This is also pretty cool. I'll let you do that. Yeah, yeah, cheers. So um, we saw Fortnite. We have Techonomy in the room, so Web3 is also a thing. And we saw at the opening that the guys talked about the metaverse by Mr. Matthew Ball. And he said, one big scalable virtual world. All of your kids play Roblox. Most of them installed the game and they signed something when you weren't there. It was a little box at the bottom. It's a you know, and you say, yes, I agree, and then you install. And what was that? That was a user end license agreement, right? And the user end, li user end license agreement says that you don't really own anything. Let's pay it. It's a simplification, but you don't own anything in there. Roblox is a platform, a virtual world with millions of people in there, and I'll get back to that, but nobody in there owns anything. And yet, it is already, in many ways, the biggest real metaverse out there. And the proof of that is in this. Adidas just launched their store on Roblox. A store, a whole virtual world where anybody can come that's on Roblox and they can buy Adidas products and they can even get products with real products with that. Just think about that because you, most of you didn't know what your kids were doing online. Well, they're in the Adidas store. Hope you didn't give them your credit card. This is yours as well. Oh, yeah, continue. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. too quick. <laughs> so, what does this mean? Well, we have virtual worlds in Roblox, we have virtual worlds in Fortnite, but we're also seeing that artificial intelligence is going to completely re-envision these kind of industries, right? Because now we have Sora, which is an artificial intelligence by OpenAI, which lets you generate these videos, as we've seen from Patrick. But you can do really cool stuff with that. Because once you've generated a video, we have another technology called Nerf. And Nerf allows you to take video footage and then generate three-dimensional spaces, like done over here. Wow! Oh, shit! Wow! Shit. Long shot works. On the right side, you're looking at an AI upscaled, color-graded version of the same footage and Luma.ai has done a marvelous job at recreating the world. Do you see the color difference? Wow, yeah, 100%. In sharpness, you can see the difference in sharpness. Dude, then this is the file we are taking to Unreal. See, and that's where it comes all together. So just so you really understand what happened here. They took drone footage, in this case, to make a video of a mountain. But then they input that footage into an artificial intelligence, which turned it into a three-dimensional world, and that they took then to go to Unreal Engine, which is what is used to build Fortnite, right? It could also be implemented in Roblox. And this is how we're gonna go from first making a real world into 3D, but because Sora AI can generate these worlds, we can then take AI to generate worlds to turn into 3D. Are you still with me? I know it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> this is footage from Sora. This is drone footage from Sora. This is all AI generated, this is fake. But you can input this straight into Luma AI and use it to 3D create this world and then you could ed edit that into a game. You don't need to code either, so maybe one of you or maybe your children is gonna be the first one billion dollar game developer with a single person studio. 
don't know what happened to this slide. Hardware. In 2018, a company called Cable Labs made a CGI-generated video to showcase what the world would look like in 2028. That was quite a spill, Clara. Your heart rate is accelerated, but otherwise you seem all right. Which is a relief, because the CEO presentation begins in four minutes. What, what is happening? Like I said, your presentation begins now. Now. So just to reiterate, Patrick just showed you all the different ways artificial intelligence is changing how we create digital experiences, right? And in 2018, we still thought that this would be 10 years minimum into the future, 2028. And yet here we are in 2024 with a clicker that again didn't work. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think my laptop is overheating or something. But um, here we are in 2024, where on the outside, we look like retards who never took off their ski goggles with Vision Pro and MetaQuest 3. But inside, we're already seeing digital worlds come to life. What, what, say? what is he? What is he? Fucking freaky. Freaky. <laughs> <laughs> hey. But it's really helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Mark and I are hundreds of miles apart from each other in physical space, but it feels like we're in the same room because we appear to each other as photorealistic codec avatars in 3D with spatial audio. This technology is incredible, and I think it's the future of how human beings connect to each other in a deeply meaningful way on the internet. These avatars can capture many of the nuances of facial expressions that we use, we humans use, to communicate emotion to each other. Now I just need to work on upgrading my emotion expressing capabilities of the underlying human. <laughs> I'm happy some people laugh here because, let's face it, it's kind of ironic that they got the two most unexpressive people on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, and here we are today. This is augmented reality today. If you have a Vision Pro, you can do this in your living room. I've done this with Patrick, which we wanted to show you in the video that crashed, but this is what it looks like, right? And yes, a Vision Pro is not ideal, right? It's a little heavy on the head, but this is the worst it's ever going to be. And a lot of this also involves artificial intelligence again, even though we are not so completely aware of that. Right? So we're moving into an ever-increasing digitized world. This is Simulon, right? Right now you can only use this on your mobile phone, but this Game Boy, as you can see from the fact that it's floating, hopefully, <laughs> it's not real. It's not there. It's fake, right? But it's so photorealistic. And we can already generate this real time. So the only real step that we're missing right now is that we have something that we can wear all the time easily to kind of have this digital overlay on the physical world. And as we know, the biggest brands in the world, Meta, Apple, are already working on that. But even small companies are working on that. This is a company from Switzerland called Creel. Creel. I always said see real, but apparently it's Creel. What you're seeing here is real. They made a lens just like the glasses on who's wearing glasses. Just like the glasses on this guy. And if you look through it, you see augmented reality that adjusts to the distance. It's real, so you have no eye strain. You're not looking at two screens slapped onto your eyes. No, you're looking at something far away, it's far away. You're looking at something close by, it's close by. It's already here, ladies and gentlemen. Within two years, we'll have meta AI glasses with this kind of technology that will allow us to not only hear augmented reality, but we'll be able to see augmented reality. And uh, when we had these glasses on and we try as much as we can, you always are confronted with the fact that the interface that we currently are using, a phone to type something, is far from sufficient to communicate when you are in AR and VR. At least you need a good working AI assistant. Siri is not as good yet as you want that to be. But there are some other options on the horizon which are also going pretty quickly. This will absolutely blow your mind. This is functionality coming from Meta. And Meta is taking a group of students and they let them look at these pictures that you see here. Then they measure with a device the brain activity, uh, activity and load it back and let the AI generate pictures of their based on their visual interpretation. And this is the result of that. On one end, it doesn't look like it at all. It's weird. On the other end, it looks weirdly the same, right? If you look at the first mid-journey versions or, or, or that were created, they were also a bit foggy, misty like this. Here you have another video where the image that was shown for a second to a person in a high reel of the uh, output generated by, uh, by a computer. I mean, for me, that's what my brain looks way more like than this, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and this is coming pretty close. In the top here, you see a device from NextMind. It's just generally available. You can program it. It's got 16 different programming uh, uh, tasks that you can give it. You have to put it on, and then you have to think about something specific if you program it, a square, a circle, hot, cold, these kind of things, so you can learn it to do some stuff with your brain. And as a girl, online there are multiple people, but she, is it clicking? Yeah, she already played. She already oh, she already played, played. okay. On the left, on the uh, right side, you see a girl that is playing Hogwarts Le Legacy. And she did her hands up. She just played it with her brains and can uh, actively play that game. The monkey, was it already played as well? Yeah, it okay. already played. <laughs> I'll just explain it. That was a two-year-old video where a monkey was uh, the first test that got a neural link in his brain. 
and they, they let it play Pong for time with a joystick, and they fed it con uh, continuously something nice, and then they took away the joystick, and he was able to play the game with his mind as well. And Neuralink is something that we talked about for a long time, but now it's actually here. The first human already has a Neuralink. We don't know how it's going. Elon says it's the person is doing pretty well. But he's still yeah. alive. He's still alive. There you go. <laughs> Just to re-emphasize, right? So we're seeing this technology where we can already read people's minds. Yes? That's what we just saw. Let that sink in. And artificial intelligence is powering that. If this is the worst it's ever going to be. Like Midjourney two years ago, for those of you that don't know what Midjourney is, Midjourney is an AI application that allows you to generate images. Two years ago, it looked like crap. Now it looks photorealistic. The same is going to be happening here. Now it looks crap. One year from now, it's going to look super realistic. You can literally read people's minds. Gaming is going to be changed forever, right? These monkeys have chips in their brains, and now we have a human with a tri chip, tri chip, 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 chip in their brain. So you can control technology. So remember when I said our phones are brain-computer interfaces, but they're only in our pockets? We're already moving away from that, and it's going really quick. In 2013, Wired Magazine released an article, and they wrote about the first digital generation. The first people to ever be born in a world where they only knew the internet and mobile phones, and they never knew a world without it. And I see there's a lot of people in this room that still remember the ancient world before all of that technology. You're a dying race. But we have gone beyond that because now we have the first virtual generation. There are now children in this world that grow up with artificial intelligence that's smarter than them, and it will always remain smarter than them. We have children that grow up today that spend hours and hours in virtual worlds, and they will only start spending more time in these virtual worlds. As we already established, a lot of you have children, and we've established that they play Grand Theft Auto and Roblox and Fortnite. But just to give you an idea, here's the three most popular virtual world games of the moment. Fortnite, 30 million players a day. Minecraft, 3 million players a day. And Roblox with 66 plus million players a day. That's the full population of Germany, ladies and gentlemen. Several times the population of the Netherlands. And these platforms, they also make a lot of money. 6 billion for Fortnite, 2 billion for Roblox. And it's only growing. But here's the kicker. They're not games. They're not games. They are not games. These are platforms. Because your kids don't go on there and they log in and they play a game like Pong or, you know, Duke Nukem 3D, for those of you that remember that, right? No, they go on there and they do stuff. They build stuff. Your kids are on there having social interactions. They create virtual worlds together. They have virtual avatars that represent their digital persona personas. They have virtual fashion, virtual assets, and they trade these for virtual money, right? That's where your Robux are going that you're buying for them during Christmas and their birthday. And they're spending already an average of nine hours a week, eight, eight nine hours a week in these games. And as you can see on the top end, the 19-year-olds are actually already entering the job market. Are there any 19-year-olds in the room? No? Okay. So the metaverse is really already taking shape. You know, the hype is dying down, and people have moved on to artificial intelligence, and they had Web3 in between, and they think none of it's connected, but all of it is connected. Because if you think about it, in a world of like Roblox, you don't own anything, right? This is where Web3 comes in. People don't realize it yet, but as our lives expand into the digital realm, as society expands in the digital realm, we need to have the same kind of rights and obligations and accountability in the digital realm, right? If you build something in the digital realm, you don't want it like it is today. Because right now, if you go to Roblox, it's basically like going to McDonald's, arriving there, then there's an empty field, and somebody says, here, you pay here, and then you can go in, you can build the restaurant, then you can build your own burger, and you can eat it, but you can't take it home with you. That's what's happening in Roblox. That's what's happening in Fortnite. Still, we need that. Or at least somebody needs to build it, right? 
And so Matthew Ball in his book said, well, building the metaverse will require hundreds and thousands of developers to do hundreds and thousands of hours of development. But what did I show you earlier? Yes? Yes, come on. What did I show you? Exactly, coding is dead. Our kids don't need to learn to code because we get Devon for that. So this metaverse is gonna be developed real quick, real quick. And we've been saying this for two years and this is why we hate this video of Jensen Huang because it's going viral now and everybody loves him for saying this. And we've been saying this for ages. Almost everybody who sits on a stage like this would tell you it is vital that your children learn computer science. Everybody should learn how to program. And in fact, it's almost exactly the opposite. Everybody in the world is now a programmer. This is the miracle. Everyone in the world is now a programmer. Because with AI, it's today, it's the worst it's ever going to be. Let that sink in. Because most people look at technology and they think, well, today it cannot do this, and today it cannot do this. But that's not the way to look at it. And artificial intelligence is the superpower booster for all of technology ever invented in the history of mankind. And it's only going to get better, faster, and better and faster and better and faster. And all of us can partake because we don't even need to learn how to code anymore. And this is why Roblox predicts, Roblox predicts, for example, that they will have a musician perform live for over a million people using motion capture like Patrick showed you. This is why they predict that Roblox will be a frequent communication channel for families. And right now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, that's crazy. But think about it. I talked to my mother over Facebook, she's 78, and she didn't even know what Facebook was in the early 22,000s, right? Neither did I, by the way. And this is why Roblox says a top fashion designer will be discovered on Roblox without having any experience in physical fashion or in coding for that matter. So this chapter was called uh, Take You to the Real World. And I'm going to show you some screens, some of a virtual space. But <laughs> what I'm trying to do with uh, this story is bring it down a little bit. We had some experience in creating these kinds of environments. And I just wanted to share my two cents of how we did it, how we approached it. So hopefully that's uh, useful for you in your organization and your roles as well. And I do that based on a story. Uh, I was the innovation director for Salesforce for seven years. And the photo that you see here is the tower from Salesforce in San Francisco. And I take you back to the end of 2020, where Corona was already four or five months in. And uh, the problem arose that we didn't have enough meetings anymore with executives. Usually big groups of executives came to the Salesforce office for a large transformational story and all these kind of things. But it wasn't happening. And we also went a lot of times to these environments. And notice here on these environments that if you look outside, there is buildings, it's on the third floor. Look at the ceiling, which is only pretty low with a large space. So we're talking about two years ago, creating a virtual environment one of many different ones, but there was, this was obviously a very popular one because everybody wanted to go to the San Francisco Tower. Um, I learned a lot of things about creating this space. So, for instance, the creativity of the team to come up with a space and make it look a little bit different. If we go through this door, you'll see that you, one of the things that's completely different from the pictures is that we have an outlook of San Francisco, which we also did with a drone picture around the tower to elevate the whole picture up to the top tower. We also tilted the tower a little bit. How much do you think we spent building this specific room? Name something. What do you think? <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that not. No, no. Thirty thousand. Uh, it depends a little bit on how you calculate. But we paid one hundred and fifty k, and that includes the architects, the three D builders, the platform, and everything on it. And that this was one of the first places, and that quickly went down. And if you look at the tools that we've presented to you today, you can do this super much cheaper and easier. Another thing that I encountered was the 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 the, the, the mental state that 
it's particularly the architects were in. They had this vision of how the tower should look because it should look like the actual uh, room. Um, so when we went in this space and we wanted the screen a little bit bigger, they really object pretty hard saying, no, you cannot do that because the elevators are behind it. And we're like, guys, we're making a virtual space here. And tr t sharing this story because those are the type of objections more than anything else that we encountered in creating these spaces for Salesforce and for other customers. And if there's one piece of advice that, that that I can give is the framing of the team of the department that is creating these type of projects. So we had an innovation network which was 10 people large. And this single slide was in every deck that I had when I needed to speak to one of the executives, explaining the difference between we are not a normal department that you can hold responsible with KPIs and that is contributing to a specific traditional type of growth. We are an explore organization. We are allowed to make failures. We did about 40 projects a year and only four, three of them ended up in the other phase. And there's another thing that happened. If you try to do one of all these different projects, whether it being in the metaverse uh, or anything else like that, and it's truly innovation, you should take in consideration that usually the customer or your own organization is loaded with a lot of just simply fear, fear of change, not understanding exponential growth, and I hope that we've talked a lot about that today, what the impact of exponential growth is, and that prevents people from seeing, let's say, the art of the possibility. What can you create with that? And the organizational structure, more often than not, is not suited for that. So that's why we kind of built an innovation network, which is basically a, not only those 10 people, it was more than those 10 people, because you take the best forward-thinking people out of all the different departments, from the partner, from the customer, from sales, from marketing, and then it ended up being a critical mass of 40 people creating these spaces, and having enough mandate to kind of put them really into the growth segment. Cool. Final stretch. Final stretch, you go. Philip is like, ah, oh, five minutes, five minutes. <laughs> the final industrial revolution. So, we're gonna go from how do you build your executive room in the metaverse to what's really going on in the world today. And what's that gonna do to us? This is the human, this is the human brain. This is the neocortex, which we developed rather recently, last 200, well, actually, last 5 million years, I think. The limbic brain, et cetera, et cetera. But now we're gonna add an extra layer to that. And this is maybe, might be the most important thing for you to take home. We're gonna have augmented intelligence. That's a brain-computer interface that I keep coming back to. Meta's yeah. new glasses has three interesting features. Firstly, it now uses AI by letting you look at objects or places or things, and Meta AI will tell you exactly what it is and where you are. So I tried to get one of these. Unfortunately, there's some geo-discrimination going on, so you can't use them in the Netherlands yet. But trust me, we'll be here next year with Philip. He'll be wearing them, and we'll be showcasing them at the reality, 100% certain, probably even this year already. We're gonna have artificial intelligence with us all the time. It's gonna be seeing what we're seeing. It's gonna know what we're doing. Artificial intelligence is gonna be everywhere. So it's not just gonna be in our, in our search algorithms online. It's not just gonna be on Amazon, but it's gonna be in every part of our life all the time. Online, you see a discussion. You see, well, it's gonna transform into artificial general intelligence and what's gonna happen when that happens, but you don't need to worry about that. Because the journey towards there will cause so much disruption in the world, you, you really don't even have time to think about what artificial general intelligence is going to do to us. Artificial capable intelligence is where we're at now. And it's going to keep getting better. And it's going to be me, it's going to be more and more disruptive. And just to show you, Klarna came out just last week or two weeks ago with a report. Klarna used ChatGPT for a whole month to do customer services. It did the work of over 700 full-time agents in one month time. It was on par with human relationships. The customer service was just as good. And in fact, they saw a 25% drop in repeat inquiries. 
So people calling back for the same problem went down 25%. Customers were helped much quicker, in two minutes instead of 10, which saved them a shit ton of time. I'm sorry to use that word. And they already uh, rolled it out in 23 markets because it speaks 35 languages. And it never gets tired, so it's online 24-7. Klarna now says that they're estimating they're going to make an extra 40 million just by rolling out this artificial intelligence agent for their customer service. And this is just going to be the first of many. A projection. If we look forward, and this is what I try to do every day, I try to look forward into the future. I try to look at what's going to happen. That's why I call myself a future historian, because I look at the past and then I look at the future. And if we're looking at economic impact of the metaverse and generative AI, it's going to be massive. We're going to go from billions today to trillions upon trillions in the next decade. But I don't personally think it's really about the money because I think our lives are going to be changed in ways we really can't comprehend. And that brings us back to the start. That singularity that Ray Kurzweil saw in the future in 2047. Right now, we live in an age where technology is more prolific than ever. It's everywhere, right? And a lot of technologies we don't even think about. For example, our clothing and how we cook, right? If you go home and you have a, a heated stove and all of that, a microwave, it's already invisible, it's natural. Money is the same thing, it's also technology, and so is electricity. These are things we don't even talk about, think about. Artificial intelligence, the metaverse are going to be the same. Within just two decades, they will be everywhere, all the time, in everything. And I'm not the only one, and neither is Patrick, that believes this. We believe that AI will be about individual empowerment and agency at a scale that we've never seen before, and that will elevate humanity to a scale that we've never seen before either. We'll be able to do more, to create more, and to have more. As intelligence gets integrated everywhere, we will all have superpowers on demand. Thank you. Do we move immediately to the panel discussion, or do you want to say something, Esther, Philip? Look at turn off my Rickroll music. Ah, nice, the microphone is on. Yeah, uh, just uh, one little thing. It's uh, tomorrow's Tech Today. So with the panel, we go to today, what's already possible now, what some companies work on. Uh, but it's, it's all about the newest tech stack. And we had this outlook in the future. But uh, I wanted to one time uh, highlight uh, Luca from the Technique, who is sitting back there, because he put little blocks under the laptop so that the laptop didn't overheat anymore. <laughs> so uh, b please, a really big round of applause uh, for Luca. Woo. And then, uh, yeah, the panelists can come to the stage. Welcome, welcome. Thank Hi. you. Thank you. <coughs> In my defense, the laptop is six years old. <coughs> okay. So, welcome guys. Let's talk a little bit further about uh, everything that just uh, unfolded. Let's uh, first introduce, here on my left, is Amal Das from Fancy. And Fancy develops a metaverse uh, environment and you are the uh, product director, right? Yeah, right. Cool. Nice to meet you. Good to have you on the panel. Yeah, thanks. And uh, to his left, we have uh, Victor van Dinten. He is co-founder of uh, DXRS, and that's an indoor spatial platform. Correct. And there uh, we have my partner in crime, Mr. Metaverse. So uh, thanks. what I prepared is uh, just a couple of questions to kind of get started, to get you a little bit in, uh, in the flow. Oh. And uh, I've added some as we, uh, as we went through the day. Um, we talked a lot about the metaverse, and maybe this is a good question uh, for you, uh, Amal. Yes. So, and we saw a definition at the beginning, uh, which is a massive 3D world, right? Now, we are now a couple of, of uh, minutes later in the presentation. So what is your definition of a metaverse? How would you describe <coughs> it? Yeah, I would actually go with what um, what you guys presented earlier, I think, uh, well, the metaverse is a big name full 
of nothing, <laughs> more or less. It can mean so many different things. But um, um, if we roll it back, I mean, we started, or the idea of the metaverse really started way earlier. And I remember um, really years ago when, uh, when uh, how was it called, like Second Life started and things like this. And there was always, there were always certain different approaches to build something from scratch and to make something magically filled with life and to, to, to build something which pulls in people just like a social media platform like Facebook did back in the day. Um, and it never really did work. And it actually only worked uh, with what you call not games, what, <laughs> what uh, we would conservatively call still games, like, uh, of course, uh, Roblox and Fortnite. And um, so I think th these are actually the metaverses, which are also of a really deep interest for, for companies, for brands, because the people are there. And that is the most important thing, you know, just building something up from scratch, hoping that it will be filled with life. We tried it. A lot of people tried it. Big companies and brands well, tried it. And uh, I, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> there, yes, I agree with you. And when we talk about Second Life, that might be true, although millions of people played it and it's still alive today. And there's people that have businesses in there. But if you look at things like World of Warcraft, World of Warcraft has been around for 20 years. Millions upon millions upon millions of people. Is anybody playing World of Warcraft here? Let's be honest. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> For the horde? For the horde. <laughs> yeah, my point is, without, you know, there are virtual worlds that have already worked and that do work, but they've been considered to be, you know, childish or games or whatever. And what we're now seeing is that we're finally seeing it becoming more mature. I totally agree, um, and uh, yeah, maybe my perspective was a little bit not clear enough because I was looking into some kind of metaverse which would be a platform where brands would also have their space. I don't think that World of Warcraft would be something nope. like that. Right. So I would excluding something like this, but this is just a, it. And uh, I would also consider World of Warcraft rather a game than a metaverse. I don't know if you would agree yeah, with that. Yeah, but that's because you don't identify as a tauren. No, I don't. <laughs> That's true. There, but, uh, yeah. there are more loaded terms, right? So we have augmented reality, we have virtual reality. You, or your company specifically, extended reality. <coughs> Can you walk us through the difference that you see and, and give your perspective on that? Yeah, first of all, thanks for the presentation. I'm still you know, left with the question, do I want to live in a world like that? Uh, because we're talking about the technology and that everyone wants to go there and that it's all to our benefit. Um, I haven't heard about you know anything about climate change or supporting our day-to-day -day lives today. It's for me, it's really far-fetched, and I don't want my children to be with a Vision Pro on all day and to be living in virtual worlds. I rather have them attached to the real world and experience real things with real people in in a social life. But you know, maybe I sound a bit old for a 40, just 40s guy, and um, you know, thinking that it will go away, but it's not going away. And we really try to use the technology to the benefit of today's life. So uh, we call it extended reality because we see that as a collection term for different types. Um, of reality. Um, augmented reality is where we bring the physical space <coughs> and digital information together at the physical space. Uh, we use virtual reality for the term where we pull reality to a remote location and then blend physical and digital. And we really apply that in day-to-day in -day things. So um, we use buildings uh, as the starting point, contextual augmented reality. We scan a building, the LiDAR example that you showed, yeah. and then basically build applications on top of that, like helping blind and visually impaired uh, navigate a train station or prepare to go to, to that train station while being at home with spatial audio uh, on uh, VR, AR glasses. So we really try to get the technology, get the most out of that, and then really apply it in day-to-day -day use cases. I'd like to jump on that because for those of you that don't know, after the First World War, they created something called what's now called plastic surgery. Right? It was created to help World War I soldiers that were injured from the war to regain a normal life. We build new technologies, medical technologies, to give them a better life. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. But it transformed. And now we have plastic surgery that's aimed not at fixing people that are broken, but at helping people change who they, what they look like, or how they perceive themselves, or how they look to the outside world, and, or fix things that they want to have changed. And this is the nature of all technology. So although I agree with you, the question, uh, you know, do we just want to be in virtual worlds? I don't think that's even a question. 
uh, one, this is going to happen, but two, ultimately, <laughs> how it develops is not we're going to be in a room with a VR headset on, but people like you will be building really valuable stuff, but that will expand to every other aspect of life, where our children will be outside wearing glasses, playing together, maybe with another child from Hong Kong or you know, Sao Paulo in the same street, seeing the same things on top of the real world. And I know that that sounds crazy, but that's where we're going. Yeah, that, that, that last part don't, don't really sound crazy or doesn't really sound crazy to me. Um, that's what we're already doing. And, you know, uh, the last example of the Meta glasses, we have them, we're testing them. And uh, the latest project is already giving us the results that we want. And it's just a normal glass. And, you know, the, the European legislation with the uh, identifier, if you're yeah. recording or if you're sending imagery, that you need to have a blinker on top of it, that's really going to help in the adoption of this. So we're really dependent on getting these hardware, you know, broadly adopted to, to roll out our applications uh, more broadly. So, yeah. Yeah, my mother, for example, I ordered a Rabbit R1, which is a little gadget we'll hopefully be showing casing later the year, because she has a mobile phone, but very often she doesn't know how to use it. But the Rabbit R1 is an AI with a camera, and she can point it at her phone and say, what, do I, what am I supposed to do? What's going on here? And it's going to help her, right? So people are afraid of having increasingly digitized world, but these technologies, like the stuff that you guys are building, are going to help us battle loneliness, help uh, you know, people that are digitally excluded from society to, to come back in. So. so talking about building things, you are very much specialized in building these environments, right? So maybe there are people in the room that would like to build something, brands in the room. What are the key considerations for any brand to start doing something in the metaverse? Well, yeah, first of all, you have to be certain about your goals. I mean, there are like more or less like I would say if you break it down it's like in the real world you know you have um, either an internal solution you want to have or you have an internal problem which you want to you know get rid of or you want to have a communication to your clients which would go to the like to the outside world which which would be a totally different kind of usage so I think that's the main question up front. And uh, in the beginning, um, you guys were showing like um, a couple of use cases, uh, which were actually really good examples. But they were like a mixture of all these things up together. And I think making a separation as a brand quite early to be sure if there's, this is something that just helps my, my business process internally, or is this something which I can use to um, gain more sales, interconnect with my clients, understand their needs, uh, yeah, and, and just get in touch with them. I think that's something, uh, that's the first question you should know, uh, or you should, you should ask yourself and you should get an okay, answer. Okay, and, and once you have that, what kind of strategy do you then uh, step into? Do you, do you build something on your own? Do you buy into a platform? Do you go into gaming? What's your advice? It's really, it's really super different. It really depends on, on what your strategies and what your communication means are. I mean, we've worked um, now really a lot, especially in the sports industry and uh, in international football, um, um, more or less. So um, we see how they work in outside communication um, and how to reach their fans, how to reach their ki new fans like kids and stuff like this. And so they drive out with like their vans and their buses and then they bring their VR glasses, you know. So they need their own environment. They need their own product, which is mobile, which works standalone on the glasses. And they have to also bring all the hardware because this is not how it usually works, you know, or this is how it usually is the easiest for them. Uh, on the other hand, if you have fake brands like Adidas or like Gucci or like uh, Porsche, uh, I mean, they have a completely different kind of target group on one hand. Um, so they really have to think about, does it make sense for me and my brand and my product to be visible at uh, on a platform like Roblox or Fortnite? Right. Is this my target? I mean, this is like the main question. I mean, um, what you wrote, like, um, but it is for kids. It's actually from Hatsaka, it's <laughs> <laughs> which is also a very awesome movie. Um, it's still more or less for kids, and we shouldn't forget that. And even if this is the generation which will, yeah, just a second, if the, even if this is the generation which will potentially buy a Porsche or Gucci clothes, original Gucci clothes, like in, let's say, 10, 15 years from now on, I don't know if this generation will still be part of this kind of 
gaming platform. I don't know if they, I mean, they also evolve and we have to really see in how far we can, I mean, I think it's, it's a big hope that we, that we can, that we will see them carry on the way as they work right now in this environment and uh, intake like all this branding and all this information and how far this will play out in the future. Because if I'm selling a Porsche um, and I'm making advertisement on Roblox, I don't know, I don't really see the match right now, but I'm, I'm, it's a chance for building a foundation for, for young, very young car fans who can, could then potentially... Yeah, well, uh, on that one, I would say it matters about your, your horizon matters. I mean, if you're Porsche and you want to sell that Porsche this year, you know, it might not work, but if you want to have a generation of kids grow up be think Porsches are awesome, then, you know, it's a different, different game. Um, I, I do think it's inevitable that as kids grow up with the experience of being in a digital world, as grown-ups, they will still be going there. I mean, I've played World of War of my entire life, for a large part of it, you know, I didn't tell people about it if I was in a professional setting like this, because I didn't want people to think, you know, I was childish or whatever. But times are changing. I'm talking about it now. KPN in the Netherlands is advertising with, hey, you can get your game on this weekend with our gigabyte connection, right? The times are changing. We're already seeing that mental mindset shift. And there might be older generations that are not getting it, but these younger generations are entering the job market. They are entering the economy. They are starting to spend money. And they do care about digital Gucci bags. Yeah, I have no doubt about that. <laughs> That's what they will do, you know? I mean, basically, j just to... Sorry, just, uh, no, no, just as no, an add-on, because you were, you were saying that, my co that the company is building, <coughs> Fancy is building virtual worlds, yes, but originally we come from the Web3 environment, which actually is, so this is also our mindset, like digital collectibles, that's actually where we came from. Uh, so I totally believe in that idea. I just, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm just looking forward uh, to the development this will take with this generation who has it hard enough to distinguish or who to, to separate the, their digital usage from the real world. And there I'm more on your side because I still think it's, they, they really have enough to crack. I have two boys, you know, they're now 12 and 17. So it's exactly that generation of Roblox Fortnite. And I see for them, like, just to get rid of their phone for five minutes, just to get off the screen for, like, a second, just not to be distracted. It's, it's, su it's super difficult for them. So I think just finding the right balance between that VR glass um, idea you have and just, like, running into the forest without any digital gadgets at all is a balance I think this generation really has to find. He probably knows how to do that. Yeah, There's he a company in it, and he, he's still saying we should be careful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Victor, you uh, move more into the B2B space, right? So what's your perspective on uh, getting a strategy into more? Because this is more a B2C story, right? How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, we would approach B2C more like B2B2C. Uh, we work with large uh, companies and organizations uh, like the Dutch railway operators, like large hospitals that provide our tools to their clients. So there's actually B2B2C. Uh, but we do learn a lot from B2C. We yeah. see how consumers behave, what, they're, what they want, what the next generations want. Uh, we look at Google, we look at Apple. And what is that? What do, what do, what do you, what's the re really take away from what B2C is doing, what a B2B company can improve upon? I think the um, you know the difference how we see it is that the, the B2C you know they don't care about privacy the, the you know the, the new new age consumer they just throw everything in the cloud and uh, we learn from that and try to get as close to the functionality that are used to using Google Maps using 3D environments in, in Apple uh, but then build that in a more private environment for B2B companies and then you know help them to get the same level of features, same level of experience actually to uh, their consumers that they're used to getting at the big tech brands. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, just from my imagination, can you give us one really, con you know, one example of, you talked about NS, I think. Yeah. What do you do with them? Uh, so we work with ProRail actually, and uh, we help blind and visually impaired to navigate the tactile strips. So, you know, the unulated strips that are throughout stations. Uh, they work with their cane and they basically get spatial audio on where to go. Um, so instead of going to, you know, a blind person go to ns.nl on his mobile phone and has this voiceover from Apple and then listens like, okay, I need to take the third exit and, you know, creating like a mental model, like prepare for that. Yeah. And we just allow them to say dynamically, where do you want to go? I want to go to Amsterdam. Okay, you go to track number six, you have 25 minutes. I'll guide you to the tactile strip. And they basically just be guided, you know. That's you know. awesome. And if, there's, yeah. if, if there's still a train, we'll just tell them, don't board this train, it will yeah. be the next train. Yeah. And 
you know, we're really kind of his guidance dog, uh, but then in spatial audio. Yeah. So they're wearing the glasses, the meta glasses with the cameras, yeah. and the t glasses are talking to them to give them input, and they can exactly. talk back to, this is awesome. But this is also augmented reality. That's, that's why I'm asking about it, because people think automatically only about digital visual stuff. Yeah. It doesn't need to be. We, we, we don't need a projection, projection class. We just use the cameras to do the localization based on initial data that we have. And then we position, and then the rest is audio. So we're not even projecting anything there. And to come back to the initial question, this for me is also the metaverse. Because the metaverse is our increased digital experience in the physical world. Right? And this is also that. Right. There's also another question on my mind. You dropped the name Web3. If we're talking about metaverses, you always get mentioned Web3 kind of almost in the same sentence. But metaverse doesn't need Web3, right? Mm. When do you need Web3 and when don't you need Web3? Yeah, it's just one big bucket where <laughs> everything is just put in, what's like new tech or bleeding edge technology. Um, the metaverse and Web3 are um, more or less siblings it can be connected it would totally make sense and it will definitely be connected in future very strongly um, I mean web 3 is for everybody around here probably um, yeah also known as um, the technology which is actually blockchain based so there is this, yeah there are a lot of um, things like tokenization and crypto um, and especially one thing which was nft which was really big in the beginning when we started so that's one of the reasons why we started it um and uh, but in in essence actually this whole nft thing did not work with the public did not work with the end consumer right, right. so web 2 users who are used to have like a normal login, like password and username, and then you log in and that's it. Um, it they were just overwhelmed with the technology, with the wallet technology, which is necessary. And uh, uh, yeah, and so it's just a... But is it just the same like with any other technology? The only difference is now we have social media, so things go around the world quicker. I mean, at the early 90s, has anybody here had a mobile phone in 1991? No. No? <laughs> yeah, that, that person over there. <laughs> How hard was it to use that one? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, so hard to use, uh, expensive. Uh, it sounds exactly the same. The only difference was that back then there wasn't a million Gen Zers with a camera around to film how you were failing to use it. And this is today's world. We see a new technology, and it spreads around the world, and everybody's hyped. But then it, when it doesn't initially, on its first attempt, make it into a successful end product that is massively adopted, then we say, well, it failed. No, we're just seeing a traditional hype cycle and the development of a technology that's maturing into the world. But there are a lot of different um, um, examples where this is not the case, where you just introduce something which is maybe not so super intuitive, like let's take ChatGPT as an example. I mean, it's something that everybody could use instantly. And this is something that has been adopted as, I mean, we've seen the numbers. So I don't know if that's a very good example because I think the wallet technology just in the end didn't make sense for the user. And I think that's the main point. I mean, you could use your phone and call somebody. That made sense, you know. But what does the wallet make sense? It's just a different kind of custodian than we have with Web2. So no, but it does make sense. When all of these Roblox kids grow up and they realize that they worked years and years and years on building virtual assets in virtual worlds and they're going to get not a single dime for it, and they finally are grown up enough to realize that these kind of things matter in the real world, then you'll have a whole generation that suddenly sees the reason, the value in having NFTs, value in being able to digitally authenticate. Is all that content totally AI yes. generated anyway, so. <laughs> That's another reason why it's gonna be important, because there's gonna be a lot of AI generated stuff out there, but if we go to Ikea today and we buy furniture, we also don't really care who made it, but we will pay five times or 10 times more for getting a really nice cherry wood kitchen table from a real uh, craftsman. And not everybody in this room will be doing this, but there will always be a market for really man-made stuff, not because it's better, but because it's human-made, because it is craftsman, there's blood and passion that went into it, like his glasses. <laughs> yeah, I think we don't disagree. I think we totally disagree. No, I, I don't. I just say that it. Oh, we have the proof that it just didn't work at that time. 
No, at that time. And that is the point. At, so at that, at that time, it just didn't work. I still completely and totally believe in that technology. And I mean, Web3, and that's also something very important to understand, Web3 is not only a technology. Web3 was a mindset. Web3 was the idea to really have, um, um, to really crack up, actually, all that um, data collecting of big tech, you know, and to just have, like, not only DeFi, but everything in, in decentralized yeah, and decentralized yeah so 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 the decentralization on one hand and also like the individuality and not saving my real name not saving my email but i'm only having this wallet for my own identification and you can and everybody can look into my wallet and that's who i am and that probably also tells more about me i we saw back in the day we saw a huge chance for for the industry that if you if you have somebody's email, it's worth nothing. You can send them newsletters, you can, you know, okay, maybe you can cross-reference with other data you have. But in the end, if you could look into somebody's Web3 wallet and you see what wallets he bought, you can, you get a really, really very clear picture of um, who uh, the client is or who this person is and what you can additionally sell it. Yeah. And uh, so I totally believe in this technology, but I still think that as long as a big tech company is coming around the corner, integrating, uh, a blockchain wallet onto your phone, <laughs> which is already then there or whatever. Until to, to that point, it was just such a fight, and uh, and the question with uh, custodian and with what the Bafin and, and uh, Mika and everything was super complicated and got regulated, and then in the end, you know, it ended up with all right, every company has to save email addresses again. So we're back at the beginning. So Can I signal that we have only uh, room left for one more okay, question? Sorry. Time is going <laughs> fast. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to get back to the remark that you made. And also got a question from somebody in the audience. Um, and do we want to live in this world, right? That's a big question as well. So how do we balance technology with human input? I'd like to hear your perspective first, uh, Victor. Um, I think it's all... Um, about the mindset and about how we want people to consume it and how we want to make money on it. If still capitalism is in the middle of this and we want to drive economies through this, we will be attracting people to live more in the digital world, to spend more in the digital world. Whereas, you know, if we would balance that out and have, a, have another paradigm and think about how we could, you know, make this work for humankind instead of the other way around, but that requires probably a few generations that, you know, are not, you know, raised to make profit, but really to, to contribute in a different way. We try to do that to just only make things available and not you know, provide our technology to advertising because you could really easily think, use that technology to sell a blind person a cup of coffee in Starbucks when he has 23 minutes left to go to his train. But we're not using the technology for that. We just use it purely for that purpose uh, of helping people around. Yeah. Um, and I think that needs to change then. But you know, that I think that all starts with the reason that you're here. Are you here to make a profit as a company and want to utilize all this technology to make profit? Or do you want to do that for you know making this world a better place? Right, right. Aragorn, I see you kind of. No, yeah, I was thinking oh, nobody <laughs> from Starbucks is in the room because Starbucks also jumped into the Web3 train and they created Odyssey. So they basically replaced their customer loyalty program with the Web3 program. Well, not completely replaced it, but they added it on top. And now I'm thinking to myself, wow, if they connect it to these glasses, then, you know, every blind person misses the train but gets a Starbucks. <laughs> um, Aragon, they just killed the NFT program today or yesterday. Oh, did they? Oh, yes, did they did. did. Yesterday they killed it officially. Oh, that's painful. <laughs> so that's They're going like to regret that. But I, I, before we go back to Web3, I want to stay a stick with this one because I try to look at technological development through the lens of history. Um, and maybe you guys know there was somebody called Hegel, <coughs> very well-known philosopher, and he had a theory. He talked about thesis and antithesis. And uh, I'm not saying that this is applicable to everything, but I do tend to see, when I look in history, I see that everything moves like a pendulum from one extreme to the other and back again. You can see it in politics today, right? Now we're moving to right-wing politics in Europe, and we came from very left-wing kind of background, and the same thing happens here. I'm convinced that we're now seeing a trend where we're having this digi digitalization of the world, virtualization, and we're moving into virtual worlds, and we have these gaming worlds, but the pendulum and swing back. Technologies like what you guys are building will bring the physical and the digital back together to create something new, something that we have never seen before in human history, but that will be both entertaining and useful and beneficial for us. And how that's exactly going to play out, I don't know, Zach. 
That's no, what I believe. Your perspective, Ramon? Yeah, hope. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully that's the way it will take. Um, but I think it mainly is about making money. So um, I'm with you there. So it's we should really focus on the the things that really where everybody can thrive. You know, can. I just got handed this one to see if there are any questions in the audience. If I want to hear a question from Mr. Skeptical here in the corner. <laughs> I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> there you go. So you talk about history and you talk about like uh, the, everything happened in the last couple of seconds. What's missing in the picture is energy. That's why I said energy. Because everything that we have today is built on uh, an Excellent. almost unimaginable amount of energy. Uh, if you look yes. at Nate Hagens and these kind of guys that talk about the system perspective on this, that's where an enormous challenge lies. And, you know, this is all nice, but packages are still getting delivered by human beings and, and all the stuff that we still need in the real world. And uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm on board with what's happening. At the same time, I see sea surface temperatures uh, in extreme this year again, uh, beyond last year. Uh, this virtual reality and all the AI in the world are not going to change that. That's that's uh, my that's I where disagree. my skepticism. I respectfully that's, that's disagree. Good, good question. Let, let me explain. Uh, did anybody here watch Star Trek? Yeah. Okay. So for those of you, have you watched Star Trek? No. Okay. So there's the Vulcans, right? And if you see the Vulcan home planet, and the Vulcans, by the way, are the most intelligent, most developed species in Star Trek, right? If you go to their planet, have you ever seen any roads? Nope. Have you ever seen any flats? Nope. Nope, none of that. It's crazy. It's like this barren planet and there's just rock and mountains. Why is that? I thought to myself. And then I realized they already virtualized everything. They all got lenses in their eyes. It's all augmented reality. So basically they don't need all of this material stuff anymore. Right? And so, yes, this sounds crazy, but this is one of the ways that this development is going to save us massive amounts of energy on the one hand. Because imagine, if you don't need to create photo, uh, photo uh, things, what do you call them? Yeah, photo lashes anymore. And the photos in there, you know, it's all digitized. You see it through augmented reality. And you have Web3 technology that connects my glasses to his glasses. So we live in the same house. We can both see it. Right? We don't need to create it. We don't need to endlessly, endlessly produce. On the same time, nuclear fusion technology has taken massive leaps this year. Why? Because artificial intelligence is helping them to improve this technology meaning that we will have cleaner energy faster. IBM has released a new artificial intelligence chip that is 60 times more, or si uses 60 times less energy. And there's many companies out there. So the energy usage is going down. So I think that the exponential curve is actually going straight up into the stratosphere. And what we'll see over the next two decades is we'll see energy consumption go way down, energy production, clean, sustainable energy go way up, and none of this will be a problem. Okay. <laughs> Philip, do we have time for one other question? Yeah, one other question. And uh, probably uh, not answered by Aragon. <laughs> no kidding. What well, was a very <laughs> elaborate answer? Little joke. Does anybody <laughs> have a question? There you go. Just a, a short question about uh, exponential. There are a lot of exponential phenomena in nature. In general, it means you just didn't run into the limitation yet. So actually, looking at these exponential things, What's going to block it? They're the skeptics. Well, he is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, could be an S-curve. Could be an S-curve. Um, you guys don't want to take it? Okay. Uh, well, I think maybe it's um, um, the level of adoption that people can take. Um, so you can just kind of over-invent things and keep on inventing, but kind of really... Uh, you know, major problems, primary problems to solve climate change and stuff like that is, you know, if we don't solve that, there is no need for this technology. So uh, I think there will be, um, you know, something like an S-curve or just flattening the curve because we're not able to adapt to this new technology anymore in the very near future. So who wants it if we can't adapt to it and if we can't use it practically in our lives anymore? So um, I don't believe that we're going straight to the stratosphere. I don't hope we go there. Um, but yeah, that might, might flatten it off a bit um, that just humankind is not able to process it anymore and then just, you know, all right. Thanks. Thanks a lot uh, for hosting uh, the panel, and thanks uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists. So, a big round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, buddy.
Thank you. And then uh, Thomas is joining me for the quick wrap up, and then we can have a drink uh, together outside. Yes. Thanks, guys. I think we have to. Can you yes. maybe <laughs> give me the well working clicker? Yes. So what can we learn from today to start tomorrow? In the end, I think uh, it's quite interesting to see how everybody has its own angle on the, the future or like how the metaverse should be uh, seen right now. I think from our perspective, what we're also seeing with, with clients, with, with businesses, with, with use cases that we're dealing uh, uh, with on a daily basis, like um, what, what is exactly the problem or challenge, challenge that you have before you start um, thinking about the metaverse. In the end, it's just a tool, just as AI uh, will be a tool just to, to make something scalable um, or, or to solve a problem. So in the end, that's really important before start talking about these technologies. Understand your audience target groups. Um, I think like uh, Amal said, uh, you should be there where your audience is or uh, what's the purpose of using this technology. I think that's really important points to consider. Uh, great immersive and interactive uh, experiences. Obviously, it's, um, it's a big difference when you look at now how we interact with brands. It's changing over time. Uh, you're not looking anymore uh, in a few years at a, at a static ad. You're becoming part of an ad in the world. So that's really important to see the difference. And it's already shifting from uh, blending both worlds from physical to digital. Leverage gamification to drive engagement. I think. When you looking at also those examples, some of them are really high end, some of them are not really tangible for most brands, most organizations. Um, so first looking at steps like start with using gamification, for example, using in-game uh, in elements to, to interact and engage with your audiences, or with your businesses to, uh, to get their attention instead of just like showing an ad or uh, saying that you have the best product. And uh, at last, uh, build community and foster connectivity, but also prioritize the accessibility and ease of use. I think, uh, like Amal uh, also said, the, the complexity of how we first look at uh, using Web3 wallets, uh, buying an NFT, for example. Uh, I think now we see more and more evolving those technologies becoming more accessible for all of us to, to buy those dig digital assets to, uh, to become part uh, of a metaverse world. Uh, I think that's really important to look at how we can utilize those technologies in, in the best way possible. So I think that's yeah. it for today. Um, I have uh, yeah, one, uh, one remark from our side. So uh, probably our answer or the takeaway is uh, in the end, uh, that's why we built an innovation hub. Uh, I think the use cases are all very different. If a municipality uh, wants to build a playground and wants to ask people what is it like, that can be a use case. If a company wants to develop new machinery, that can be a completely different use case. Do you want to get to new target groups? This is so different, and that's what we see, and that's why we built an innovation hub with different residents, with different partners, so that we can funnel basically the questions to the right partners in the end uh, of the tech stack. Yeah? Yes. That's it. Thanks a lot uh, for your uh, attention. <laughs> and then uh, we see you outside.